Welcome to the Empire Season Preview of the St. Joseph's Hawks. I am Benjamin Simon. And I am William Derry. St. Joe's returns a season after going 11-20 and overall in a year that was marred by injuries and inconsistency as head coach Phil Martelli couldn't find a constant lineup. The three top scorers from last year, Siobhan Newkirk, Lamar Kimball, and James Demery played in only two games together throughout the season due to injuries. While Newkirk may begin the year unable to play, when he does return, it will be interesting to see how all three mesh together as the year progresses. They are surrounded by a supporting cast that returns redshirt sophomore Pierre Francesco Oliva from injury along with sophomores Charlie Brown and Nick Robinson. Coach Martelli heads into his 23rd year at the helm of St. Joe's with the aspirations of another NCAA tournament appearance. Now, well, when we're taking a look at this St. Joe's team, how are they going to be able to, uh, you know, kind of complement each other with uh, the two guard play, the two guards that they have with um, Shavar Newkirk and Lamar Kimball? Uh, do you think that they'll be able to complement each other like they did last year? And do you think they did a good job last year of complementing each other? Yeah, you know, last year, St. Joseph's, like everyone knows, dealt with a lot of injuries. Uh, before the season even began, Chuck Oliva, who had a solid start to his freshman year, but started to um, hit sort of a wall towards the middle of his year, and he didn't actually finish the season as a starter in Coach Martelli's lineup. Uh, Checo went down with an injury before, the, before preseason. So he, from the beginning of the year, the Hawks knew that they wouldn't have Checo. Then... James Demery went, went down against Toledo after having a pretty good home opener. Um, he was you know, one of the leaders in scoring that night, but then following the game, he felt something wrong with his foot, so he got it checked out by the trainer, and he found out that he fractured a bone in his foot. So then he missed three to, uh, three to six weeks due to that injury. Then when Demery returned to action against George Washington, Shavar Newkirk went down. Uh, unfortunately, he tore his... ACL against the Colonials. And then following that, Fresh Kem- uh, Lamar Fresh Kemble went down with an injury of his own, which sidelined him for the rest of the season. And they just, they could not stay healthy last year, which, you know, hurt them as, hurt, hurt them as a team because they didn't have their best players. But when they were healthy to start the year, when Fresh and Shavar played with each other, you know, the ball was moving. Um, you know, you would think that having two point guards in the Floor at the same time would be chaotic, but you know, uh, Fresh would bring the ball up the court. Will bring would bring the ball up the court sometimes. Shavar would you know play off the ball and vice versa. So I think that Shavar and Lamar played well last year when they were healthy. Um, Shavar was having a crazy year before he got hurt. He was averaging almost 20 points a game. He was leading the team in scoring. He was you know setting up his teammates for open shots. He was finishing you know at the basket. So it was unfortunate that he went down at that point in the year because he was having a tremendous year to that point. And then as far as Fresh, I think Fresh last year, after Shavar went down, showed that he could carry the team on his own. Of course, not having Shavar hurt them, and, you know, they lost some games because of that. But I think that, you know, Fresh stepped up before he went down with the injury of his own, and I showed that, you know, he took a big step from uh, his, you know, took, took a big step in his second year with the Hawks. And then as far as, you know, James Demery, Shavar, and uh, Fresh playing together, you mentioned that they have only seen limited time together as a trio. So I think it'll be interesting to see, you know, what the, chemi- what the chemistry is. You know, before James went down um, with that injury, I'm sure over the off season and, you know, throughout preseason of last year, they did play together. So it's not like they haven't played together in practice. It's just they haven't been able to do it in a live action, in a game situation. So I think it's possible. I think that, you know, people may worry about the ball being, you know, uh, held too long by one player or another. But I think that, you know, the three unselfish players who are, you know, willing to make the pass, uh, Demery last year showed that he could shoot. I think before last year, it was always like, oh, man, James is shooting. Is he, you know, is it going to go in? But, you know, I think last year, James showed that, you know, he can knock down the shot while, you know, also taking care of business on the defensive end. So I see the trio uh, fitting in well. Yeah, I don't I don't really think that they, like, I think specifically, I mean, we never saw them, all three of them play together. Um, I'm talking specifically about Shavar Newkirk and Lamar Kimball here. I didn't really think that they 
mesh as well as maybe the statistics say. Um, the statistics say you have two players, one that's averaging 20, one that's averaging 15 and a half, and you're saying, wow, they really did fit well together. But if you look at the record before Shavar Newkirk went down, they were only, before the George Washington game, they were only 6-5, and five, and they had lost to, you know, they had lost to some tough teams like uh, Ole Miss, uh, NC State, Temple, Villanova. They had lost to Illinois State team that um, went to the NIT, was the first seed in the NIT. Um, but I wouldn't say that, like, they were necessarily a perfect pair. Um, I think both of them um, have grown up being, uh, like, straight point guards. So not having a ball um, was a little challenging. And I thought they, uh, I thought the ball would kind of get thrown around sometimes, that they'd turn the ball over a lot. Um, him and uh, Newkirk and Kimball both average a combined um, uh, five and a half turnovers per game. And that's just too many, especially if you're having two ball handlers out in the fl- out there on the floor. Should honestly be less than that. I think it will be interesting to see how they uh, complement each other this year, and um, definitely want uh, after Shavar Newkirk shot so well from the field, forty six percent from the field, thir- almost forty percent from three, and almost eighty five percent from the line. You're going to need that step up from Lamar Kimball, who just didn't shoot nearly as well, shooting thirty six percent from the field, thirty two percent from three, and less than 70% from the free throw line, which is definitely, definitely has to be higher. You know, I can see your point about, you know, Shavar and Fresh's stats to uh, showing more so that they are a good pair and, you know, that may not hold true, you know, in game action. But I think that it's possible that they, they make a good duo. I think, you know, I can see that LeVar's stats probably went up once Newkirk went down because probably just because of usage, he had the ball more, he'd have to worry about, you know, sharing it with the other person. I just think that, you know, I think they can play together. Um, you know, I feel like Fresh is probably more the guy who needs to be on the ball and then Shavar off of it. And then, you know, because, I don't know, I just think that, yes, the stats show show it, but hopefully this year they could actually, you know, make it uh, happen on the court. Yeah, that's for sure. I, I think that uh, Lamar Kimball is going to have to show more ability to, to play off the ball uh, without the ball in his hands, hit that three, um, and he's got to control the ball better. I don't think he did a great job of that, and I don't think that, um, you know, I think that's fine if they're both taking, you know, Shavar took 13 shots a game and Lamar took 14. That's, I mean, that's fine if I'm Coach Martelli. I mean, these are your two best scorers. I think Lamar Kimball has to be more efficient. I think that they have to get more comfortable playing side by side. Um, I think defensively it's fine, although that they're both, um, you know, they're both not big point guards in terms of height. Uh, with Shavar Newkirk standing at six foot, and uh, Lamar Kimball standing at six foot as well. But they're both big, strong guards that I think don't have a problem covering the other team's two guard. And I think that they'll be helped out by having um, James Demery back and James Demery's ability to play. Uh, defense both in the post and on the perimeter. Yeah, I agree. Um, staying with St. Joseph's backcourt, one player that had high expectations coming into the year, but unfortunately went down with an injury of his own, you know, after St. Joseph suffered all those injuries last year, the last thing they needed was for a player to go down before the season even started, and that was sophomore forward Charlie Brown Jr. Brown suffered a fracture in his left wrist, during practice a week before October 25th. He underwent surgery thereafter. Uh, he's due to miss a few weeks. I know that Philly.com uh, wrote an article not too long ago saying that Charlie Brown was trying to get back for the season opener. And uh, he began rehab immediately after surgery. Uh, last year, Charlie Brown had a solid freshman year. He was named to, uh, before, before he went down with the injury this preseason, he was named to the preseason all in at 10-3 team. Um, he earned 8-10 all-rookie honor, honors as a freshman last year. Last year, he averaged 12.8 points per game, five rebounds per game, an assist, shot about 38% from the field, and was the team leader in three-point shooting, and also was the team leader in free throw percentage. Um, he scored in double figures 25 times and was uh, a three-time Atlantic 10 Rookie of the Year. And I think that when healthy, hopefully, you know, he'll come back and won't miss a beat. Of course, 
he may have to work his way back into shape because he had to, you know, probably, he probably was sidelined and wasn't able to really do anything once, you know, after surgery and letting that wrist heal. But when healthy, Charlie Brown is someone that can take pressure off a fresh James Nimbury and Newkirk and be a flat out scorer for St. Joseph's. I think he showed that last year and, you know, nothing, he should only get, he should only progress and get better during his sophomore year. Charlie Brown's going to be really important to the St. Joe's Hawks. Um, reason being, they really need that off-ball shooter. Uh, obviously, Charlie Brown's um, bigger than your normal off-ball off -ball guard at 6'7". Uh, at and if you look at Charlie Brown, if you look at the, the St. Joe's offense, you have two point guards on the floor that are fantastic at attacking the basket. Um, they both get to the line at a good rate. Um, Lamar Kimball got in the line almost five times a game. Shavar Newkirk got to the line seven times a game. Or, well, took the had seven free throw attempts per game, and the Mark and Blood almost five, and that tells you a lot about um, their game, which is kind of getting to the hoop, and that's a huge part of, of how they play or how they should play. I, I think Lamar Kimball shot too many threes, shot five threes a game. Um, I don't think that's where you're going to see him playing his best basketball. And Charlie Brown is really important for spacing the floor in that sense. It's going to create opportunities for Newkirk and Kimball to drive, uh, for Demery to drive. And without him there, uh, you, you have to plug in a guy like Taylor Funk or a guy like, um, and these are people I haven't talked in, you're going to have to rely on the freshmen um, to play more, and that's Anthony Longpray and Taylor Funk because they're two of your best uh, three-point shooters outside of Charlie Brown. Um, and you, you can't play someone like, uh, you know, for instance, Jai Williams or, you know, saying that, let's just say Charlie Brown doesn't start the year out, um, because you need that you need that shooter to help space the floor and create space for Newkirk when he's back, create space for Kimball and Demery. And without Brown or without uh Funk and Long Prey playing, um, you know, it's gonna it's gonna be able to for people to play off, guys like James Demery and uh, you know, uh Nick Robinson who didn't shoot very well from the outside last year. Um so I think, you know, Charlie Brown's really important in that aspect of space in the floor. I agree, and it was um, unfortunate for him to go down when he did because people were talking about Charlie Brown being the next St. Joe's player to be an NBA prospect. Martelli mentioned that when DeAndre Bembry was with the team that he made sure that Bembry went to the Nike Basketball Academy before his senior year to, you know, get a look from scouts and to get his name out there on the radar. So Brown is someone that the program is hoping that can be that next star. Hopefully, you know, before his senior year, I know that's a ways away right now, but he can attend the Nike Basketball Academy to get his name out there and to, you know, let scouts and uh, people around the country know um, that he's a, he's a, he's a NBA hopeful. I think that at his size at six foot seven, 192 pounds, and most likely he'll get stronger as he uh, gets older in the program. He, he has the, he's the prototypical NBA guard. He's, you know, someone who can, you know, shoot off the, shoot off the bounce. He can get to the rim. Uh, he can create his own shot. He can, you know, get a, get teammates involved. So I think that, you know, him going down with the injury was upsetting for the program and for everyone there because of um, what they hope for Brown to become in the future. Now, Will, if, if Shavar Newkirk and Charlie Brown do not start the year, uh, do not start the year in a you know, in the lineup, um, which a Philly.com article just suggested that they might. But saying that they don't, uh, who's wh what's your starting five looking like, and how's the team looking like for those couple games where they're going to play without Charlie Brown and Shavar Newkirk? Yeah, uh, like you mentioned, uh, the article about Philly.com saying that Shavar and Charlie Brown are trying to get back to full fitness and return to the lineup before the season opener. But if that does not happen, if Newkirk and Brown are not ready for the home opener, uh, not the home opener, are not ready for their season opener. I think at the one, you're going to see Lamar Fresh Kimball. At the two, Nick Robinson. At the three, James Demery. At the four, either Taylor Funk or Anthony Longpray. And at the five, Checo Oliva. I think that, you know, having to deal with not having Newkirk and or uh, Charlie Brown for that those those first couple of games or however long until they return it's going to be tough because when you have to put guys like Robinson 
uh, Funk and Longprey in the starting lineup, that takes away from the bench, the bench for the benches production. You know, I think that it hurts them as an overall team when you have to use, you know, your seventh or eighth man in the starting lineup. So I think that the rotation could, you know, right now the rotation with New Kirk and Brown in it or it's probably eight to nine deep. So without that, without uh, New Kirk or Brown playing, you're going to see the rotation probably shrink a little bit. You may have to use, uh, you may have to move Checo from the five to a four and then putting a big man like uh, Markel Lodge or Jai Williams to try to give that protection around the rim. I just think that trying to deal with uh, not having those guys can be tough because what happens if someone in your starting lineup gets into foul trouble? Then you're looking down the bench and you're going to have to go with, if it's a guard who needs a sub, you're looking at Chris Clover coming in at the point guard or shooting guard. And then at forward, um, depending on if Funk or Long Prey starts, you're going to probably switch them out for each other uh, if one of them gets into foul trouble. And then um, after Funk and Long Prey, you're looking at someone like Lorenzo Edwards who missed last year with a shoulder injury. So I think that the lineup um, without Brown or uh, Newkirk in it will be Lamar Kimball, Nick Robinson, James Denbury, Taylor Funk, or Anthony Longpre, and Chuck Oliva. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think it'd be. I don't. I don't. I just don't know how hard it can be for Phil Martelli to kind of get his team ready, without knowing if two of your focal points of your team and offense, um, like they might not be there to start the season, and it changes a lot in your game plan. And it'll be interesting to see how they deal with that, uh, you know, prospect of change and, and the worriment of change. Uh, what'll be interesting to see is how the freshmen step up. They're obviously two highly regarded freshmen, um, and two freshmen that you should expect to see play minutes early in the season. Anthony Longpray is someone that you could definitely see starting, um, at, you know, after the first game. I mean, not after the first game, after the first couple games. I agree. Longpre is originally from Quebec. He, Quebec, Canada. He moved to the United States during high school. Uh, he moved to Glenelg, Glenelg country, Maryland. Uh, he's six foot ten, two hundred and forty pounds. He played with Canada's U nineteen national team this past year. He won a gold medal at the FIBA U nineteen basketball world cup in Cairo. Yeah. It was can. Yeah, that that's scored something a, I scored a couple points too. Like, um, you know, one game had uh, had four four points, eight eight rebounds. Um, you know, didn't score a ton, but you know, did his thing. And for Canada, that was their first ever gold at a FIBA international competition. So he made history. Yeah, he did. Uh, it'll be interesting to see. Um, you know how he fits in with the team. I think as someone as. Uh, He's similar to, uh, and I, I think maybe even more talented than uh, Checo Oliva, Oliva. Yeah, I agree. He has the size to play the five, but he could also play the four. Uh, I think that you know he's someone who could step out and hit a jumper, Definitely. and can you know make that pass out of the post. And he's someone who could probably you know break down his defender and uh, get a few baskets that way. He's a accomplished high school player and international player, like I mentioned before. So I think Long Prey could definitely see some minutes early on and if Newkirk and Brown are not able to go he may find himself in the starting lineup yeah that's for sure what's interesting to see is that he he just started playing basketball recently um actually when he was uh you know this one article by the uh, Baltimore Sun cited that he didn't start playing competitively till 11 or 12 and if you take a look um he's listed on like for instance 24 7 sports he's listed at 6 9 2 15 on St. Joe's website, he's listed at two six ten two forty. Seems he's gained twenty five pounds and an inch since that since that point, and that, that's that's not easy. Um, there was another there was another article that cited his ability um, and their expectation for him in high school uh, to play the one. Um, I know that sounds extremely odd, but uh, you know one article cited that uh, his high school coach. Um, saying in in the United States, saying uh, for us, he's been asking the quote 
uh, for us, he's been asking to play point guard for two years. He wants to run a point. Those ball skills will help him at the next level. I'm actually trying to work on some sets now that could allow him the chance to play the point guard. So that's something that he's been developing and the ability um, like Checo has to kind of get a rebound and, and take a couple dribbles for the outlet. Um, also the ability um, you know, to pass and, and have that vision of the point guard uh, will be very valuable and I think would, uh, would mesh well with a guy like Checo. Because they're similar. I agree. And it's funny because if you look at this year's recruiting class with Taylor Funk and Anthony Longpre, they're very similar to Checo. Yeah, and I think actually they're better shooters than Checo. Um, Anthony Longpre is a very good shooter and has very good range. And I think people will be surprised by just how, how ready of a college shooter is. And same thing with Taylor Funk. Um, people have spent so much time talking about Long Prey that I feel like they've forgotten about Funk and just how successful he was in his high school career in the Philadelphia area. Yeah, Funk is a Lancaster PA native. He went to Mannheim Central. He's a six foot nine, two 225 pound freshman forward. He was a 2017 Associated Press All State Class 5A first team selection. He averaged over 24 points a senior year. Like you said before, he's a great shooter. He had 64. He made 64 three-pointers during that year. Uh, he was an All-Lebanon League first-team selection in 2017. He was Manhive Central's all-time leading scorer with 1,977 77 points while hitting 229 career three-pointers. And you know, one thing you you notice when Funk when you watch Funk play, you know, in high school was just he would take over games. His team, oh, yeah. uh, as far as for Mannheim Central, he didn't have, you know, much help. He was, you know, their defender. He was their, um, he was their playmaker on the offensive end. So, you know, he showed a full arsenal of ability on the offensive end. And, you know, I think that he has the size to comfortably play the four. He could possibly guard the five, but I, you know, see him at that three or four position. And uh, if he did play against the five, the opponent's center, I think that you know he would take advantage on the offensive end because of his ability to score from all levels. Yeah, I think he could be a real big steal for Coach Martelli and the St. Joe's staff. Uh, he was the first. He was uh, by the time he committed to St. Joe's, he was just getting offers and interest. Not offers, but interest. I'm not sure about offers from schools like Virginia and Notre Dame, and he had offers from George Mason, LaSalle, Ryder, Boston University, Monmouth. Um, and he was his he averaged uh, he was third team all state um, and in the AAU circuit he played for Jersey Shore Warriors who I'm pretty sure went undefeated uh, his junior year uh, when they were on the AAU circuit and just a very good um, team he played for a very good AAU team uh, where he was pretty much the focal point of the team and Taylor Funk's a guy who can shoot who can score and I think a lot of people will see the similarities pretty quickly between him and Charlie Brown as two six eight swingmen um, that are versatile, um, that are that are very good shooters, um, long, and uh, have a lot of potential. And I think that's really exciting for St. Joseph's because you know with the way basketball is going, you have guys who are six eight six nine playing you know one through four, and now they have long prey and funk core in that you know in that uh, group of guys who are 6'8", six, 6'9", six, can put the ball on the floor, can shoot the three, can guard the other teams three and four. You know, I think Martelli, like you said, got to steal with Funk and have a long prey as well, combined with Oliva, who has three years of eligibility left. Wow, I don't know. It's, uh, that's exciting for St. Joe's fans moving forward. Yeah, and Funk, he's been someone that's been committed for a while, committed as a junior. In um, in 2016, so May 2016, you know he's been someone that's been uh, wanting to come to St. Joe's and uh, committed early. Um, when I think he probably would have ended up getting some bigger offers had he waited around for a little bit longer. Uh, I think both him and Long Prey could be a huge steal for St. Joe's Hawks, and they'll have plenty of opportunity, especially at the beginning of the season, uh, to show their ability to do just that. Now, one player that. I, you know, I have to bring up just because of how he finished last year is junior guard Chris Clover. Now, Chris, Chris Clover, Clover was a accomplished player at St. Joe's Prep. He, you know, won all types of awards while in high school. And I think his freshman year didn't go the way 
He wanted it to go. He didn't see much playing time. He didn't shoot very well. And I think that, you know, he probably was unsatisfied with how that went. And I thought that, you know, the so- his sophomore year was kind of shaping up to be like that too. But with all the injuries, with Newkirk, with Kimball, with uh, Demery's injury for that span before conference play, uh, Clover had got a chance. He made 18 starts in 30 games. He averaged 22.7 minutes per game, averaged almost 8 points per game, 2.2 rebounds and assists. He had about 36% from the field, 29% from three. He, had, he did have nine double-digit scoring games, surprisingly. He also had five games where he scored 13 or more points. And uh, I think that, you know, when, he's, when he is playing like he did in high school, I think his best attribute is his mid-range game, and, you know, he could also finish to the basket. Now, Ben, is, it, is Clover's statistics and the way he played towards the end of the year a result of the injuries that uh, St. Joseph's, Joseph's suffered, or is this who Clover really is? Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at, you know, when looking at the end of the year stats, he did score double digits in, uh, in five of the last seven games. Um, and he played 30 plus minutes in all five, in all seven of those games, but only shot above 40% once in those seven games and shot 40% on the dot in another game. And then in terms of threes, which is a, you know, a large part of what you, you're going to want from a guy like Chris Clover, um, only made more than one three in in that seven game stretch where he scored in one of the games. So, am I counting on Chris Clover to play thirty plus minutes a game? No, but do I think Chris Clover could maybe bring a spark plug off the bench um, as a swingman? Yeah, I do, and I, I think he has to because they don't really have a really backup two guard um, outside of Nick Robinson. Uh, I think. Chris Clover could get buried when everyone comes back and injured, and I think we start to see just how good these freshmen are. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised even at that point if he came in for spills here and there uh, for a couple minutes and hit a three, and that's what they would expect from him. Um, has to shoot better than 36% from the field and 29% from three if he wants to get minutes. Um, that's just not going to be acceptable, especially with the role they're going to want him to play. Yeah, I'm just... I'm interested to see if we're going to get the Chris Clover from his freshman year or the Chris Clover that showed up for the second part of his sophomore year. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of hard to tell. I think that I, I, I think that he has to be a role player, and I don't think he ever really kind of got comfortable with the role that Coach Martelli wanted of him, um, especially after being the kind of go-to guy in St. Joe's. Uh, I think he's going to have to figure out his role in the team, and – once he figure out, figures out his role and is able to adapt to that, I think Chris Culver definitely has the talent um, to see minutes. Um, but he's got to get his confidence up, and hopefully the end of the season did that as well. We we'll just have to see. Now, another person who stepped up for St. Joseph's last year, someone you just mentioned, sophomore guard Nick Robinson. He actually played in all 31 games, which was, you know, very uh, rare for St. Joseph's last year that a lot of players – who suffered injuries, and you know he made 19 starts. He averaged 23.4 minutes per game, five points, uh, 3.6 rebounds, and almost two assists. And he shot about 36% from the field. And like a, like Clover, he took advantage of the opportunity once um, once guys uh, went down with injuries. And I think that you know like Clover, Robinson has to you know be a a key guy for them off the bench because you know. Who knows what you know? Well, who knows what's going to happen this year with everyone's health? And they need they need bench production. If it's not going to come, it has to come from someone. And you know, with that guard position, it's either going to be uh, Chris Clover or Nick Robinson. And you know, Robinson showed last year that you know he has the ability to handle the ball, but most likely he's someone who's uh, most likely going to play off the ball. Can knock down a shot more so. I would say he's someone that is uh, better at. Uh, attacking the basket. What did you think of Nick Robinson's freshman season? Yeah, I think Nick Robinson had a complicated freshman season because obviously when you see a guy who's not a point guard step up and play 23 minutes a game when their point guards go out and he was asked to play point guard, that's impressive, especially at Division One level. But he all, I mean, it's hard not to notice the fact that he did struggle and he didn't really do a whole lot when he was in the game. He ran the offense, um, he didn't turn the ball over, but 
he didn't necessarily do anything to you know kind of initiate offense um didn't really do a whole lot uh in that respect was a solid defender um but you got to give him credit for where you know the position that he was thrown into um as an off ball player and then asking him to kind of asking him to carry the ball down uh bring the ball down the floor a lot um behind Newkirk and Kimball uh I thought that Nick Robinson as someone who's going to feature as an off ball player in college uh you know, did a good job for the role that they asked him to step into early um, in his career. Obviously, you'd like to see him um, score the basketball more than he did. Um, you'd like to see him, uh, you know, shoot the ball better than he did. But, you know, I think given the circumstances, you can't be mad with Nick Robinson. Um, the better question is, uh, what role is he going to have this year, and um, how will he fill it? Yeah, I I think that Robinson, you know, made the most of his situation, and I think he could have played better, like you said, but I just think that uh, with you know when everyone's healthy, he may be someone who could be you know left on the bench. But you know I think he did show last year that he's someone who's just going to adapt to the situation. He's going to do his best and try to uh, uh, make it work. Yeah, and I just want to talk about James Demery real quick because I feel like we haven't been able to talk about him. Uh, James Demery, someone that you did a long form piece about in his injuries. Um, so definitely interested to hear what you have to say. But without uh, Kimball and Newkirk, uh, Demery was able to score the basketball, averaging almost 15 points per game, and I feel like that was often overlooked uh, by the fact that people were just like, eh, St. Joe's year is over, these guys are injured. Um, but Demery was able to score the basketball, shot almost 43% from the field. Um, obviously, he's not going to shoot threes, um, so we're not even going to go over that stat. But... Uh, he showed his ability to attack the basket, and obviously James Demery comes in as someone that is a fantastic defender, a fantastic competitor, an athletic guy. Uh, what will be interesting to see is how he'll fit in with the full roster. Like we said, never got a chance to play together. Um, and I think he'd be a great option, like they wanted him to play last year at the four, um, when they want to go small ball and want to run with these two point guards, when they have someone like Charlie Brown in the game, Chris Clover. Um, and they and now they have Checo back, who can definitely run. Um, last year they were playing guys like uh, Bauman, um, which that just isn't their thing. Um, now they will be able to run a lot with Checo, uh, with Long Prey who might be in the game, even Markel Lodge. And I think having Demery at that four um, could open up a lot of things for them. And I'd be interested to see um, how he fully adapts to that role with uh, everyone around him healthy. I would too. I'm looking forward to see what Demery does with uh, this year's group being able to combined with Checo in the front court. But you mentioned that the long form piece that I wrote about Demery last season when he went down, well, when he came back, he made his uh, return against George Washington. And then after that game, I sat down with him and just asked him, you know, what happened? I uh, joked around with him because I was away at school and I had, you know, read the stat line and he was one of the players who had a good game. And then I got a press release from St. Joseph saying that he was out injured, and I was, you against, know... I against to, Toledo, right? Against Toledo in their season opener. And then, you know, I asked James, you know, what happened? And he said that, you know, before halftime, he, I guess, did something to his foot. He thought that it was something, maybe like an ankle injury or something that was minor. So he just, you know, played through it. But after that game, after they uh, finished their contest with Toledo, he returned to the locker room, and he just couldn't, he couldn't walk on it. So he asked St. Joseph's trainer Bill Lukaszewicz to check out his foot and he went to the doctor the following day at Lake and all and you know he found out that he had fractured uh, a bone in his foot so that sidelined him for a, an extended period of time and I you know I talked with him uh, when he returned against George Washington so this was after he made his return when he returned to the team it was a uh, uh, it was I think it was maybe a few days before the uh, New Year's, and uh, he got a standing ovation from the crowd, and he had a pretty good game against George Washington. And, you know, one thing that, you know, he mentioned to me was that he had, uh, uh, he, did, he knew that he was back when he made a open court dunk on the road uh, following that uh, George Washington game. He, he said during the George Washington game, he was hesitant, of course, because, you know, he hadn't been out there, and he was still trying to gain back that trust uh, with his body, you know, which can happen to athletes after suffering an injury. But he knew once he uh, made that dunk in the fast break that he was 
all the way back. So I think that, you know, Demery, uh, fortunately, you know, he missed 10 games last year after suffering that injury. But then, you know, once he was back, he, you know, stepped up, like you mentioned. He was uh, all, an all big five second team selection. Uh, after Newkirk and Kemmel went down, he was a team leading the score with 14.5 points per game. He led the team in rebounding. And, you know, just like you mentioned, like we uh, haven't gotten, a ch- we didn't get a chance to talk about Demery early in the podcast. I think Demery has been overlooked uh, during his entire time with St. Joseph's. Yeah, that's for sure. You know, I think people are, his, his, his time at St. Joseph's has just been marred by his inability to, to shoot the basketball, which is unfortunate because he brings so much else to the table. And I hope he'll be able to show that this year, um, especially with his ability to attack the basket because he really is a good finisher. Um, you know, if he really just got that free throw percentage up and just his ability to hit a three a game, um, or even just so people don't sag off him, I think it would have just done that much more to his kind of reputation um, as a basketball player. I also want to take a look at the uh, schedule that they have for this year um, so we can take a look at uh, who St. Joe's playing and our prediction uh, um, for the year before we uh, wrap up um, our, our conversation today. Uh, well, you know, to me, this doesn't look as competitive as you might have liked to see for a St. Saint- Joe's um, team that is expected to, uh, you know, I think the expectation is to win a, is to win the A10 and to make the uh, NCAA tournament, and uh, barring everyone healthy, uh, you know, I don't know. I just kind of felt under- underwhelmed by the schedule, and I felt like, uh, you know, they definitely could have played more competitive teams at the beginning of the season. Yeah, to say that is. Um an understatement. They they don't really have any games before conference play starts. They go, uh, they start the season against Toledo in Ohio, and then they play against Illinois, Chicago. They have an early season matchup against Princeton at home. Good and they Princeton have a, team, but someone some, that you would expect St. Joe's to beat. Yeah, good Princeton team. Someone that you know is gonna is gonna challenge them, but someone that we expect that uh, St. Joe's can handle. And from November 23rd to November 26th, they go to Fullerton, California for the Wooden Legacy Tournament. And the first game is against Washington State, who is a, a good opponent. And, and after that game, they either will play Harvard or St. Mary's. And they return back home and play against Bucknell, Villanova Temple, Maine. And then they have a... Basketball Hall of Fame Holiday Showcase on December t- December twentieth against St. John's, and then they start conference play. I feel like their non conference play is is small. I feel like you know, with the other teams we've previewed over the past couple of days, their schedules have their non conference schedules have been have been loaded. Yeah, I don't I don't think you'd describe this non conference schedule as loaded. Um, I think it'll definitely be something that. You know, if this team really is an at-large team, I think this could come back to haunt them when looking at the, uh, you know, when looking at the NCAA tournament. Obviously, the uh, the Philadelphia, the Big Five games um, will be good contests always, um, but that's an expectation. Um, I wonder if Martelli and the staff uh, use this schedule to – uh, provide them with a way to kind of get comfortable playing together, to get guys healthy before conference play because that's more important to them. In that case, I would understand, but um, still might have uh, uh, wanted um, some uh, bigger games in here. I agree. I you know, I think that if they are going to make the tournament, they're going to have to do really well in conference play because they're not going to have any major wins against non-conference teams once they, you know, um, you know, hopefully get to the Atlanta tournament and are vying for a spot in the NCAA tournament. So I just think that, you know, it's an underwhelming non-conference schedule and they have to do really well in conference play this year. Yeah, what will be interesting to see is, uh, I mean, if if they make it to the championship of the Wooden Legacy, uh, of the Wooden Legacy preseason, I mean, uh, pre, pre, uh, pre-conference play tournament, um, they'll be able to play a team like Georgia, um, San Diego State, uh, 
And they'll also face a St. Mary's team in the second round, barring that they beat Harvard, and if and if St. Joe's beats Washington State, um, which would obviously be a good game. St. St. Mary's is always ranked and always good, uh, you know. But other than that, um, you know, it will be a good opportunity though. This, uh, you know, schedule at the beginning of the uh, before the conference play. Uh, for them to get acquainted playing with each other, to get everyone back healthy so that when conference play comes around, um, they're really starting to get in the groove of things. Now, Ben, how do you think that, how do you think St. Joe's will do this year? What do you think the record will be? My expectation for St. Joe's is an NCAA tournament appearance. Um, and I don't think there's anything less, less than that that people are expecting from this Hawks team. Um, barring that everyone is healthy and plays, um, you have one of the best guards in the A-10 in Shavar Newkirk um, paired up with uh, Lamar Kimball, who will also be one of the best guards in the A-10 um, if he shoots the ball better. Uh, they have one of the best perimeter defenders and best overall defenders in James Demery, and I think they bring in two of the most talented freshmen that the A-10 has to offer in their uh, freshman recruiting class, and an underrated recruiting class, if you ask me, in Anthony Longpray and Taylor Funk. So I really think the St. Joe's team could be really good um, obviously once they get everyone back. But if everyone plays, the expectation is definitely an NCAA tournament appearance. I think this season is going to be a lot different, like you said, than last year. They went 4-14 four and 14 in conference. Four wins. They only won four games in conference last year in the Atlantic 10. So I, def I see them winning, you know, at least 7 to 10 conference games this season. And like you mentioned before, having Kimball, Shavar, Demery, hopefully Charlie Brown when he returns, Checo back this year. Having everyone healthy is going to make all the difference. And like you said, I think that, you know, they're a team that can compete for another Atlantic 10 championship and should be uh, watching, you know, should be one of the teams up for making the NCAA tournament this year. Yep, so we're definitely on the same page, you know, in that respect. Uh, but, you know, you know, other than that, um, I don't really have anything else to add unless you have something to add, Will. No. Oh, well, um, well, thank you for listening to our um, season preview of the St. Joseph's Hawks. Um, we will be releasing uh, previews for each of the six City Six teams, um, just talking about, uh, you know, the different ways and the different outlooks that we'll see the team coming together, um, including start and lineup, schedule outlook, um, you know, what newcomers you should look out for and um, just all the comprehensive coverage that you can imagine. Uh, we'll be using um, a platform through writing um, to express our ideas, but then also using uh, podcasts to get across our ideas. Um, so you have two forms of um, media and two, two mediums to uh, really consume the information that we're providing for you. So uh, thank you for listening to the St. Joe's Podcast. Um, I'm Benjamin Simon. And I'm William Barry. Thank you very much.